You know why we trust God? A number of reasons, I guess, could be placed in there as a response, but I trust God because God's got a plan. He's got a plan for my life. He's got a plan for your life. And watch this. Not only does God have a plan, but God has a strategy. There's a difference between a simple plan and a strategy. A plan is just a plan. A strategy means that I've given thought to all of the various details concerning your life. It's that passage that says that God causes all things to work together for good. That word work together is a Greek word. It's a Greek word, synergeo, where we get the word synergy from. So there is synergy between what is frustrating you and what God has promised you and everything in between because God not only has a plan, but God has a strategy. Mm. Feel that right there. When I'm... When I'm looking at something to invest in or somebody to partner with, I, yes, I want to know that they have a plan, but when I really get into my due diligence, I'm looking for the strategy. Because the strategy not only has in it what will happen if things go right, but the strategy, come on, when you're thinking it through, the strategy has in it what we're going to do if something goes wrong. God's got a strategy. Can you help me prophesy? Do me a favor, turn to somebody and say, God's got a strategy concerning you. God's got a strategy concerning you. God's got a strategy concerning you. God's got a strategy. Put it in the chat for those who are watching via live stream. God's got a strategy concerning me. And one of the things that I was hearing as I'm preparing to continue in this series that we started last week, called God in Business. I heard something when I was praying for you just a moment ago, and it was this. A lot of the hmm, challenges, problems, and frustrations that you are facing right now in this moment as you're trying to piece together and put together your, your life, your future, your plan, and everything, will be remedied as you get a revelation of the fact that you're called to do business. Jesus. <laughs> Somebody's like, I, I'm, I'm creative. I'm not a business person. I, I, leave, I have a business manager. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I've got a business manager too. But I'm looking at them contracts. I'm like, There's not one deal. Come on, somebody. I look at every word. I got attorneys. Guess what? I'm looking at every word. And every once in a while, I'll catch something that the attorney missed. Long gone are the days of, I'm just going to watch this, or here it is, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm not a business, I'm an influencer. I don't know any successful influencer that doesn't understand the business of influence. Hello, somebody. So I say all that to say, we're gonna, we got a conversation to have. I say all that to say that some of the things that are frustrating you right now are going to be remedied and relieved as you catch this revelation, one, about your identity as a business person. And as you start moving in that identity because it is a kingdom identity. And you say, is everybody called to business? Yes. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. He said, do business until I return. He didn't say just sit around and praying and hope and pray and all that kind of stuff, right? You pray to create the pathway. You, you pray to get the strategy. And the strategy is never sitting down and doing nothing. I can tell you right now, whatever spirit gave you that strategy is a lie. The strategy is get busy. Get busy. Go after it. Do business. Watch this. Take some risks that aren't risks if I called you to take it. Huh? If I called you to take it, it's only a risk in your head. It's the path. 
So I want to talk about that. I want to pray. We're going to jump right into it. God, thank you so much for this time together. If we didn't do anything else, just this time together in your presence and in your house would be enough. And we're so grateful. Thank you for what you've done in our hearts already through our worship and through our praying together and through our being together and in this atmosphere and environment, God, if we left at this moment, it would be enough. And we say thank you. But God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and it is a light unto our path. And God, I thank you that you're gonna prepare a table for us right now that we might dine from it. I thank you, God, that, that you will lavish us with revelation and wisdom and insight in such a way that not a person here or one watching via live stream will miss nourishment and spiritual nutrients that will cause us to be who you've created us to be so that we might become and function and accomplish that for which our very breath exists. God, I pray for myself first. May the words in my mouth and the meditation in my heart be acceptable in your sight. Give me the tongue of the learned. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight and knowledge, God. Fill me up with divine substance that would feed your beloved children wonderfully, that we would walk out of here full and blessed and, and our eyes just enlightened and our understanding deepened and our faith stirred and renewed that... Uh, to the extent that we would actually run after a vision and accomplish it. And then, God, I pray for those who are under the sound of my voice, God, I pray that you would give, her the inner, give them the inner discipline to silence the voices of distraction and discouragement and of disbelief, but that we would be good receivers and that the word would take root and bear fruit, that we'd be better as a result of it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please greet somebody as you take your seat here today. Thank you so much. Mm. I, I, um, I started something last week. Um, my, plan, my plan was to come in last week. I was praying, like, you know, God, should I come in? Because like, my, my vision is to be here first Sundays of every month, every first Sunday of every month. And then when we kick off Thursdays, to be here uh, third Thursdays. And so um, that would be my spiritual in-person contribution. Of course, I'm praying and interceding. And we have incredible pastors. Can we take a moment to celebrate our incredible pastors? Every pastor in this church, please stand. Come on, y'all. Stand up. Incredible leadership team. Anointed. Blessed. Rich full so grateful for them and so my efforts to further support them and what they're doing here day in and day out I purpose to come first the first Sunday of the month and the and when we kick off Thursdays the third, third Thursday so I was praying I'm like well that's the the, the, well, the the fourth is the first Sunday but God said no I, I need you to I, I need you to be here on the 26th or whatever that last Sunday was. I think it was the 26th. I need you to be here on the 26th or 27th, whatever it was. And it kind of all bleeds in together and then you, when you get 51. But anyway, um, and I really felt like I was supposed to be here last week. So I'm like, all right. And so I get here last week and God starts really dealing with something that he's been dealing with me about as it relates to God and business, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I got here and, and, I, and I got into it and the flow was so much that I realized, oh snap, I gotta come back because I'm supposed to be in Texas this week. You know, and I just said, no, I, 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 got, I gotta come back. And so I'm here, so it turns out that it's a two-parter, but really, I, I think I could do this forever because I really feel like we have missed the importance of business in the kingdom. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying. I, I feel like, and I'll recap where we went last week to catch everybody up, but I feel like as, as a church family, we have not seen business as a spiritual means to advance the kingdom. And so much so that we've actually, you know, we, you hear things like separation of church and state and various things, and I, and I do understand some of the reasons why we say that. I don't think that, that, that we ought to be meddling into things that we should meddle, and I get that. But 
there has also been within the church itself, there has been this removal of business. You'll hear things like the sacred and the secular. Show me where that is in the Bible. The, the sacred and the secular. And, and, or, or this sort of um, disdain about the ministry in the marketplace. The ministry in the marketplace, that conversation is a new conversation. Because at first, it was like taboo to bring ministry in the marketplace. No, we just have our church, and we do little church stuff over here. And then business is taking place over there, and God forbid you mix them. As if some sort of way, if you mix them, it will create some sort of toxic thing. You know what I mean? And we'll have an allergic reaction. <laughs> you know what I mean? To it. And, 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 and that's not true. If you think about what the marketplace is, see, we're, we're all in the house of God right now. And so what we have in common, what, what we're united by is our belief in God and our belief in the importance of coming to the house of God, right? But what is a little bit more powerful and quite frankly more integrated is the marketplace. So just think, just think, you guys are here, and I'm so glad you're here, all eight, nine hundred of you, and that's wonderful. But there are billions of people in the marketplace. So if God wants to reach the world, why would he keep us from the marketplace where all the people are? That's stupid, uh, not stupid. That, that's, that, that's not the best thinking. And God is brilliant. So the marketplace has always been a part of God's mandate. But the religious mind, see, it's the same religious mind that told you to, to make a vow of poverty. Show me one place in the scripture where God says, make a vow to poverty. That is uh, uh, not the smartest. Way. He says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Show me one place where God says, hey, I came that you might be impoverished. Show me. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It is anti-biblical and it's anti-everything that God is about. God said things like be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, do business until I come. So there are a lot of things that we have to unlearn because there's some people that think it's actually spiritually cute to not be in the business place. No, I'm not, I don't do no business. Yeah, you do. Every time that bill comes in. <laughs> yeah, you do. And so the reason why this message is important to me, and I'm going to recap a little bit last week, is because, family, I sense this real strong, and I don't say what I don't sense. And I don't say what I don't sense and take to the Lord in prayer is that the vehicle of business is going to be one of the prime vehicles that God uses to advance his kingdom and advance his agenda. If you think about it, even historically, Everything moved on the trade route. When you wanted to influence a nation, when you wanted to influence a culture and a society, all that stuff happened as you moved along various trade routes, communication, uh, religiously, all those things happened on the highway of trade route. Why? Because it's where everybody is. I bet there's not one person in here who hasn't been on Amazon. Some of you probably ordered something at the beginning of the service. You, you thought you, you needed something. And you, why? Everybody's there. Why would God say, I don't want you to do business? I don't want you to be a part of the marketplace. No, God is where the people are. And everybody has to walk through the marketplace. Why wouldn't God want his people there? So there's some unlearning that has to take. Can I talk to you like this today? So I just want to do a slight recap, just a little bit of recap from last week so we'll be all on the same page and I want to get to the important message or the important part of this conversation that we're going to have today because this is everything. So what we learned last week was one, the whole parable in Luke chapter 19, I believe it was, uh, verses 11 to 27, read it when you get a chance, catch up on it. The whole purpose for Jesus 
teaching this parable about business is because the people in Jerusalem who were supposed to understand the deep spiritual things had a misunderstanding about what the kingdom was about. He perceived, he said, they thought that the kingdom was this. And so Jesus comes and he's like, no, let me really teach you what the kingdom is about. And Jesus starts talking about business. So that lets us know it is possible for our hearts to be in the right place, for us to really, really desire God, but not really understand how God is moving and working in the earth. And so we learned that, that the whole reason why he has this conversation is because of improper thinking as it relates to the kingdom. We also learned to see God as a business person. We had never seen God as a business. I know I had never seen, but then I started thinking about it. God has an idea. It's called, I, I wanna create the heavens and the earth. Then he speaks it. Then he creates it. It comes to fruition. But he doesn't just leave it there. He gives detail to it, specificity, and then he creates systems and structures. It's called night and day. And he creates the heavens and the earth. And then watch this. He develops it to be a self-sustaining ecosystem. Think about it. He puts all the trees in there. And, and each tree and everything, every plant had a seed within itself so that it would continue to grow and flourish in perpetuity, so much so that the CEO now can sit down and just watch his processes managed. I said, oh my God, I never saw it that way. And then he passes it on to his heirs. Come on, business person. Come on, Rockefeller. He, Vanderbilt, don't play with me up in here today. He passes it, he passes it along to his heirs. And he doesn't tell them to build it all over again. He just says, I need you to tap into the system, the ecosystem that I have created already and be fruitful. And all you got to do is be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, dominate. That's it. He has set down any good executive entrepreneur, founder, business person does not create something that they always have to keep their hand on. They create things that make money when they sleep. Hello, come on, come on. We learn that God is a business person. He sits down and there's nothing to say that he ever stood back up. He sets it all in motion. Look at, can you see the thought, the strategy? And he sits down and he watches it. And it says, and even unto now, what he set in motion is still in motion. God is an exec. So we learn to see God as a business. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we are God's children, created in the image and the likeness of God, then if God is a business person, so are we. <laughs> Can we talk like this today? Y'all quiet. That's good. I mean, y'all thinking. Come on. Yeah. So we learn to see him that way. We also saw, as we looked at it last week, we saw that as God is breaking down his parable, as he tells them to do business, he gives them, he calls 10 of his servants together and he gives them minas, 10 minas, and he says, now take this and do business. So we learned that, that God has given to each of us something that is anointed to multiply. Feel that right there. There's nobody in here who has nothing. Mm, I feel it. Broke is a mentality. And the broke mentality simply says, I do not have what I need. That's why David says in Psalm 23, it's one of my favorite Psalms, he says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, better translation, I have no lack. The broke mentality says the Lord is my shepherd, and I'm broke. Those two don't even mix. God is a good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, better translation, I have no lack. So when I begin to shift my thinking, I stop thinking or speaking or saying or believing that the question is, God, give me something to a better question being, show me what you gave me. Because right now I possess something that has the anointing to multiply. 
So that means I do not have, I do not have to be hung up over how small what I have appears to be. Because if it's designed to multiply, what does it matter how small it is if it's designed to grow? Ah, you gotta catch that, you gotta catch that. Because a lot of times we're like, oh, it's too small, I, I, I don't have anything to work with. Yeah, but, but you're forgetting it's anointed to grow. It's anointed to multiply if you work it. So if you don't feel like it is substantial enough, that means that you haven't worked it enough because if you're faithful over a little, I'm going to make you a ruler over much. So you got to work what you got. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, work it. Work it. And, and what happens, instead of working it, we make up excuses about it. Mm-hmm. We make up excuses about it. It's not enough. You know, and sometimes we get caught in what I like to call compare and despair. Oof. Watch this. You are comparing somebody's harvest with your seed. My Lord, Jesus, Jesus. No wonder you're coming up short. You are looking at somebody's harvest. You are looking at somebody that worked their little until it became much. And now you're selling yourself short, but that ought to motivate you every time you see somebody on the level that you're trying to get to, just say, I just need to work it. I just need to work it. I just need to work it. Mm -hmm. Feel that thing. I need to work it. I need to work it. See, somebody told me all I got to do is pray and it's going to come to me. It's going to come to me. No, it ain't. Who lied to you? You have to go get it. You gotta go get it. God's not gonna give you anything. Yeah, go get it. All I need from you, God, see, this is the type of spirit that God wants to cultivate in us. I don't even need you to give it to me, God. Just tell me where it's at. Just tell me, just, just show me where it is. Oh, I feel that right there. I feel it right there. Oh, I feel it right there. Just show me where it is. I, I, I don't need you to go get it for me. Isn't that what the centurion said? The centurion, you know, the centurion had a need, and Jesus was like, I'll come to your house. He said, oh, no, I don't need you to do that. Uh-uh, baby. No, uh -uh, no, Cletus. I don't need you to do that. He says, I don't need you to come to my house. He said, just speak a word. Speak a word. Tell me where it's at. I don't need you to put character in me. All you got to do is let me know that it's there and I'm going to lay hold of it. If that's you, holler at me real quick. Where are my Caesars at in God's house? Just tell me it's there. We're shining. Somebody come fix my pack real quick while I'm talking. Just tell me that it's there. I don't need you. Uh -uh. We, we, we want God to do stuff. As a parent, it's hard to do sometimes because I spoil my girls, especially my babies. I spoil my, I spoil my boys too, but I really spoil my girls. And it's hard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's hard because there's sometimes, especially Ella. Ella, Ella sometimes she gets me. <laughs> That's my seven-year-old. And she, daddy, and he, and daddy. You know what I'm talking about, right? And I think I got it. I think I got it. Thank you. And, 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 and what I will, I, I wrestle to not do this. But sometimes she gets me. I'll be honest with you. I try to never do something for her that she can do for herself. In doing so, I am, watch this, both affirming her in her ability and also stretching her belief in her ability by taking a step back and say, I'm not gonna do that. Baby, I need you to reach a little bit. Because if I step in and do it, what I will do is I will create deformity. And that doesn't help anybody. So God is not going to, to hear me clearly, he's not going to give it to you. 
I used to get mad. People say, Jesus, you know, they didn't say Jesus. They say, God ain't coming to save you. I used to get my, my religious part. I think I told you last week, my religious part, I would get mad and say, I bind you. That ain't true. He is coming. Yeah, he's coming to save your soul. But he's not coming to start that business. Come on, somebody. He, he, he's not coming to draw that business plan for you. So, so we talked about how God has given to us something, every one of us, something that is anointed to multiply. Right now, right now, right now, you have something that is more than what it seems like. Mm. Oh, I gotta take my time here. And, and, and the more you believe it and you embrace it and you bat down the thoughts of inadequacy and you bat down and you swat down all of the excuses and you really see yourself as carrying something that will multiply and you start staring at it and you get curious about it God's going to begin to show you what you're working with and it will multiply I can't get off of this we got so much ground to cover I can't get off of this I just want to keep saying it until you get it you got something you're carrying right now you're carrying something you're carrying something the, in the story the figure that represents God goes away to a far country and comes back and the whole time that this figure representing God is gone those who he had left it with were carrying something so as long as you have breath you're carrying something and it will multiply and this is prophetic for somebody and for some of you there is an acceleration on the multiplication for those of you who think you're past your time or you're past your prime <laughs> multiplication is multiplication baby are you hearing me that, that's the difference between addition and multiplication it happens faster so so anyway so he, we learned last week that we have something that is anointed to multiply uh, we learned that what was interesting is as when when the 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 master the nobleman okay this is God when he comes back and he makes inquiry of what they did with that thing that they gave them to multiply. First of all, he gives it to 10 people. Only three people come back, which means that seven people just stood by silent. Those are the people who just get what they have and eat it. Just live off of it, don't multiply it, just, just and it's gone. They have nothing to say, but oftentimes everything to say. <laughs> they're, they're not even, they're, they're, they're not even, uh, they're not, they're not even qualified to speak about it because they did nothing with it. They didn't multiply. They didn't even save it. They just ate it. And now these seven, you got to study the story. These seven are standing by and should be completely, if I were them, I would just shut up. I would just be completely quiet and watch the big boys, big girls, big folk do their stuff, right? But they have the nerve to, just let me have a little fun here. They, they have the nerve to come up and get mad when God takes from the person who had multiplied the greatest and had 10, and they took it from the one who didn't do anything with it, and they took, God took it from the one, gave it to the one with the 10, and now all of a sudden, these people who are silent the whole time now speak up and believe that this is unfair. Hello, somebody. The only reason why I take a moment to go across it is because here is the truth. God will do things in your life that will seem, it will be, you will be convinced if you listen to the wrong voices that it's unfair, that you're not worthy of what God brought you to. And when you're in those moments, I want you to remember the moments that you were sowing when folk were chilling. Come on. When, when you were really after it, after the things of God, after the things of purpose. I want you to remember that because sometimes it's difficult to receive God's blessing. Because we feel like, well, it should be them too, and I don't want it. If they don't have it, I don't want it. Child. Uh-uh. Never apologize for being blessed. Never apologize for harvest. You're not better than anybody. It's not that at all. But sometimes we feel like, well, if my homie can't go, did your homie sow? Hello, somebody. Did they sow? See, here, uh, move on. But here, here is where we get in the way sometimes. God is trying to develop somebody by showing them through your life 
what faithfulness and consistency looks like. And you're trying to reach back and bail them out, squandering their opportunity to really understand what it takes to go to the next level. Because you feel guilty. No, don't get in the way of what God's trying to do. And they will say it's unfair. And they will say you think you're better. Let me tell you something. I know I ain't better than nobody. But I might work harder than you. You got me there. We're just having a real conversation here. I, I need to move on. So, so, so we learned that there's always going to be opposition when you decide to work, right? We also learn, and this was very interesting. So when the, when the ones come back with the three, the three come back. One comes back, that individual had traded with it, did business with what God had given to them. And they increased by 10, okay, multiplication, boom. God was like, yes. And there was one who had increased by five because they traded, they did business with it. Now, one would think that when God got ready to reward them, that God would reward them with more meanness. You were faithful over a little, a little, let me make you a rule over much. But he doesn't give them more money, he gives them cities. He, he rewards them, he rewards, watch this, them doing business with cities or territories. Which helps us to understand that what God is really after is not you being rich per se. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, kingdom people. Yeah. He's after your influence over territories. Yeah. And business allows you to do that. Yeah. There was a movement in the church. I got to move on. There was a movement in the church that kind of divided the church a little bit over the past 25 years or so. And it, it can be dubbed, just for the sake of you understanding the movie that I'm talking about, it was a prosperity movement. Remember that? And, um, and you know, it, 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 was, it was tricky. You know, I, it, there was a lot of criticism over it, rightfully so, to be honest with you. Um, but I understand why it had to happen. So the prosperity movement was, you know, preachers and pastors, and they were talking about, you know, how God, you know, doesn't want you to necessarily be poor or broke or whatever. God wants you to prosper, right? And, and that is true. I mean, it is very true. I mean, that's all through the scripture. If I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you now, we can talk about what that means. But still, prosperity is not a cuss word. It's all through the scripture. Abraham prospered, all these sort of things. But there was, to be honest, there, in my estimation, again, who am I? But there was a, kind of a, an imbalance of emphasis placed on stuff. Bentleys, and jets, gold, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that was the sign or the evidence that God was really pleased with you. And, we, you know, and again, I'm not judging anybody, but we kind of got it wrong a little bit. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, right? But it was how we marketed it. And so much so that those who opposed it called it the prosperity gospel, and it caused a lot of division, you know, and again, rightfully so. I, I looked at some of the cats like, that's too far, man. That's too far. But I think at the same time, we were for a long time far removed from the notion that it was even okay to have a little something. I'm serious. I'll be honest with you. Because I, I, I came up, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, I was, you know, for a young guy making some good money in tech. And I used to kind of like hide, hide my success. Because being prosperous was almost frowned on. Now, just because you're rich, you think you, you know, like being rich is something. Like, when did that become a bad thing? <laughs> like not living check to check. When did that become so evil? As you can pray, pay your bills and help some. When did that become so bad? But somehow, so I understand that there was a need to begin to shift the mentality of church folk who were taking vows of poverty, who were wear poor like a badge of honor. I'm poor in the mug. <laughs> Modeling poor, you know what I mean? Just like. <laughs> no, we 
we did it seriously. We condemn the rich and be walking around there talking about, you know, and that's why I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. You ask somebody how they doing. Oh, hanging in there, man. Just if I had your hands. Come on. Come on now. You heard that before. Dumbing down the notion of success. You never heard nobody back in the day, you know, and it's getting better now. But you never heard of my oh, I'm blast doing well, ball. I just closed seven, eight, nine deals. No, no, we had this false humility. Oh, just no, you're, I can't call the man. You the one, chief. All these little things. Maybe just in my culture. You never walked up into a barber shop or whatever. How you doing? Oh, doing well, man. Just closed my first nine-figure deal, man. Things are going really well. Praise God. <laughs> no, bro, if I had your hand, I'd trade mine in, man. <laughs> no, you the one, killer. Ha, 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 ha. And that's it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm not, really? <laughs> so we would wear poor like it was a bad job. Like we were more spiritual because we had less money. You might have a million dollars, but I got the Holy Ghost. How about a million dollars and the Holy Ghost? As if <laughs> the two are mutually exclusive. So I understand, again, some got carried away. I get it, I, you, I, I get it. But I do understand why, but I even think even in its purest form, it was still lacking. Because there's a difference between becoming a wealthy person, a wealthy individual, and owning successful businesses of the same or lesser wealth that has influence over people and regions and cities. It is more advantageous to the kingdom that you have a billion dollar company whose products are in the homes of nations. Think about it, your product is in their home than it is for an individual to be worth 50 billion, but he or she doesn't have the influence and reach, which means that a success, in my estimation, a successful business is more impactful than a successful person. Are you hearing me? Can we just talk a little bit? We're just talking, we're just talking. So that's the good news. The good news is that God is raising up business people. He is. That there is an anointing in this time for you to do business. And there are going to be all sorts of resources. I've got the call podcast, which is great. But, uh, but the call to illuminate conference is coming up in May. But before that, next month in March, We've got the International Leadership Summit in Dallas, Texas, where we're going to be giving tips and tools. We've got good soil in June, where we're going to be tips and tools and even capital to entrepreneurs. So there's all sorts of information that's going to be out there to go with your impartation and to go with your revelation. And, and I believe, and I'm just, and I just sense this so strongly, this, by this time next year, Seriously, some of you are going to be so far ahead because you have adopted this, not as something because you're trying to get on, but something that you know has the potential, the power, the anointing to advance the kingdom that your next year this time is going to look completely different. You hear me, Book? There's a reason why you're here. So that is the good news. That is the good news. But there is some not so good news. And that's what I want to talk about for the next 10, 15 minutes. The challenging news, I'm going to be 100% honest with you, is that it is very difficult. It is hard to do business on the level of your potential and remain completely sold out to Christ.
He ain't heard no preacher say that. I love you too much not to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you right now. Hear me clearly. It's hard. Harder than you can imagine. To do business on the level of your potential and truly, truly, not lip service. I just, first of all, I want to thank God. Yeah, but your work all the way up to that moment did not thank God. You got a real one today. I'm talking about like being sold out to Christ for real. It's hard. Can we just talk real for a minute? It's real hard. I ain't gonna lie. In fact, Jesus talked about it. If we look at Mark chapter 10, verse 23 through 27, it says, then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, let me give you some context really quickly. This is after Jesus has an encounter with this fellow by the name of the rich young ruler who had a whole bunch of riches and he said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, ah, I'll tell you what, you know, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me. The rich young ruler said, no, thank you. <laughs> and the scriptures say, that he went away sad. He said, no, thank you. He went away sad, meaning that he made the decision, but he knew deep down within himself it wasn't the right decision, but he was so caught by his riches. That You ever done something that you know was wrong, but you did it anyway? That's called being stuck. Brother R. Kelly will put it this way. <laughs> My mind is telling me no. Pero <laughs> but my body. Anyway, I, I'll move on. I, sometimes I go too far. I, back to the story. Uh, the rich young ruler, um, when God lays it out and says, hey, yeah, yeah, no, I got a space for you, but what you're going to have to do, what you're going to have to do, and mind you, this was not a universal directive. This was his directive because God knew him. The dude came up, rolled up on Jesus trying to be, you know, like, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He knew that he was paying his tithes. He knew that he was doing such and such, and, you know, he didn't commit a door. He, he was clean in all these areas. So he rose up on Jesus, like, you know, knowing that he was clean in all these areas, and he's like, yo, so what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Play, uh, 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 what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus like, yeah, just don't commit. Da, da, da. Jesus knew that. Jesus, Jesus is a master. He's so cold. He was toying with him a little bit. And, Jesus, and the dude was like, yeah, Jesus, I'm doing all that kind of stuff. And then Jesus, you got to study. The scripture says that Jesus turned at him, looked at him. And I mean looked through him. He says, yeah, that's true. But one thing you lack. And he says, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. Gotcha. How many of us know that we serve a God who's a gotcha God, right? <laughs> I know where your buttons are. I know where your limits are. I'm always going to challenge you according to your limits. I'm not trying to do it to disqualify you. I'm trying to do it to get you to the highest version of you. And so if I don't, if you have a relationship with God that doesn't check you to your core, you're not in a relationship with God. It's a figment of your imagination. Because God knows a you that's beyond you. God knows the deepest you, the highest you, the most virtuous you, a you that's more virtuous than you can ever imagine. And so God will always watch this make a demand on that you. And sometimes it, it has to do with what you are willing or not willing to give up. So he says, boom, he says, I sell everything you have. And the rich young ruler says, got me, and he goes away sad. Knowing that he's making the wrong decision, he goes away sad. That's the context, that's the backdrop of this his pastors. Okay, then Jesus looking around, his, his disciples are around him, who, by the way, are all entrepreneurs. The majority of them are entrepreneurs. One was a tax collector, right? It was rich and everything. They're looking around like, oh my God, wait a minute. <laughs> so Jesus looked around at them. He said to his disciples, he says, how hard? Now, here, back to me saying it's hard. Jesus says, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you something. If I say it's hard, it's one thing. It's another thing for God to say something's hard. And not only does God say it's hard, 
But he says how hard it is. Woo. Oh, this is about to get real good. This is the part you're supposed to wake up on if you were asleep. <laughs> then Jesus looked around and said to him, back up real quick, back to 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Right? Now what, look at their response. It says in verse 24, it says, and the disciples were astonished. Woo. See, I love that about God. God does things sometimes to shake you up. Because he's going to give more detail in this next definition. But sometimes God will do something to get your attention. Jesus was very dramatic. And then he says, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, and watch the language is going to change a little bit. He says, children, how hard it is for those. First, it was those who have riches. But then he gets a little bit more specific. He says, how hard it is for those who, who trust in riches. So the issue is not having per se, although he did say it is hard if you have it. But he gets into why it's hard. And the reason why it's hard is because oftentimes we begin to trust, or that Greek word literally means to rely, we begin to rely on those riches. And that is a problem. They were astonished. He says in verse 24, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And then watch this. Ooh, and you've seen this part. And this is so good. I can't wait. And this is so good. Then Jesus, again, dramatic Jesus. Jesus is straight up dramatic. He says, how hard. He says, it is easier for a camel You been to Dubai? You been to Egypt? You been in the Middle East? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I'm coming back to that. 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 Then it says, and they were greatly astonished again. Now they're frustrated because you remember, these are entrepreneurs, they're fishermen. Now, listen, Peter's fish fry. <laughs> Peter's fish and chips, baby. Best fish and chips in the world. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> the tax collectors, man, these, these, they were balling. They, had, they did all right. They left. And now they're just astonished. Well, who can be saved then? And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. So let's unpack that. Let's unpack that a little bit. So, so it's, he talks about, first of all, he says it's hard. So I, when I said, hey, all this is wonderful, I got some good news, but I got some bad news. Good news is it's on you. Good news is it's going to happen. Good news is if you lean into it, you're going to realize it. Bad news is... And you thought the heart was getting to it. It might be challenging to get to it, but that ain't the heart that Jesus is talking about. The heart is not getting to it. The heart is who you have to become when you get to it and the price that you have to pay. That's when it gets hard. Mm, I feel that right there. Because the lie is once I cross over this hidden threshold, once I go through whatever I need to go through and cross over, once I arrive, once I watch, oh no, no, here it is, once I step into my destiny. <laughs> Money is not your destiny. Impact and identity is your destiny. Money, your destiny? Hey, hit the lotto tomorrow, that's your destiny? And be broke the next day, that's your destiny? Oh, hey, anyway, this this line. You think it's, once I just crash over this threshold, yeah, everything's gonna be easy from that point on. And this, all I need, Jesus. <laughs> no, that's when it's that's when the heart starts. So the process on the way up, watch this, is to develop you. So what? So that when it really gets hard, when when watch this, when your soul is on the line. 
You can stand. Mm -hmm. But this camel through the eye of the needle business. Now, you've probably heard, if you've studied this theologically at all, theologians have this thing about the camel through the eye of the needle. That I, I, I think they're lying. I shouldn't say that. That was divisive. I, I, I think that they're exercising their creative liberties. Because it, it is, God, God says it is easier, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to grow through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom, right? That seems like impossible, right? So we, the theologians started, started making up, you know, an alternative explanation for what that meant. And so if you study it, you have some theologians say, oh, well, no, it wasn't really. It, you see, what happened was, <laughs> it wasn't really about a camel going through the eye of a needle. See, the needle was a gate in Jerusalem, okay? <laughs> And so what will happen is the, the, the camel, see, you got to pay attention, see, you got to know, you got you to know your stuff, got to do your studies, okay? And so what happened was there was a gate, uh -huh, there, there was a gate in Jerusalem that they called a needle. Okay, now I sound like Cat Williams. There was a gate, and, and <laughs> leave that one alone. Uh, and, 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 and so the camel, the camel had to come through the gate, but the camel had all the stuff on his back, so the camel would have to kneel down and then lay off all the stuff, and then it could go through the, the gate that's called a needle. See, it wasn't a real needle, you know, and uh, uh, stop it. Jesus, you mean to tell me Jesus didn't, he wouldn't have alluded to that at all a little bit? No, Jesus said it's hard, it's easier for an actual camel to go through the eye of an actual needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Watch this. You know how I know that's true? Because he says, in the sphere of man, it's impossible. A camel going through the eye of a needle is not impossible. If the needle was just some little cute little gate in Jerusalem, that's not impossible. It just requires a little bit of effort. No, I think... When he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, I think he meant it. Period. Straight out. Straight out. And he says, not only is it hard, but with men, that's, it's actually impossible. But wouldn't the God who created the camel and created the needle and created the physics of the universe have the capability in that moment if it be God's will to reduce a camel down to a millionth of its size to get through it if he wanted to. He says it's impossible with men, not with me. With God, all things are possible. What it speaks to me is that you can do it, but you have to change your form feel the Holy Spirit so strongly. You gotta change your form. You gotta change your shape. You have to become something that you're not in order to fit the path that you're called to traverse. Are you hearing me? Let me tell you a story real quick. Seven minutes, and about, about seven minutes, and we're done. Twelve minutes. Um, I... I, I used to go to London every six weeks. I used to go to London every six weeks. There was a group of young people that I was mentoring there, and I would fly out there every week. And, uh, and I used to stay in Central. Anybody from London in here in the building? In London, the people? Make, no, make some more, come on, don't be, don't be shy. There we go, yes, I love London. I'll be there in July. Um, and I used to always stay in Central London this hotel in Paddington, I love this hotel. And so I went to book my flight and book my room and everything and this hotel wasn't available anymore. And so I, um, I decided that, well, you know, at this time, I, I'm going to maybe stay at a private residence, you know, because they have all those flats in central London. And, and so I went on the website and there was a beautiful flat. Oh, it was gorgeous. And, 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 and the, 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 um, the website described it as luxurious. 
spacious, right near Hyde Park and very upscale. And I said, oh, praise God, this is for me. And I get there and I walk up to the door and it looked a little, it didn't quite look like what they were selling on the internet. I opened the door, I kid you not, I opened the door, I looked inside, and I promise you, I could stretch and touch the wall from the front door. My kitchen literally was here. My cot of a bed was there. The commode was right over there. And I said, oh, the devil is a liar. I was shocked. And you should have seen me. And I got my phone out, and I'm getting ready to call my sister. You got to fix this. Fix this. This is not fitting for a man of my stature in the community. (laughs) Fix it. And while I am asking to be delivered from that ungodly situation, (laughs) I heard the voice of the Lord say two words, humble yourself. And I said, Mwah. <laughs> Mwah, Lord, <laughs> I'm your guy, remember? God said, said, humble yourself. Now, I had the means to make a shift immediately. And quite frankly, I had a good excuse. You know, I'm here to do the work of the Lord. I need ample space to study. To lay out before Jesus and to be quiet and everything. But those two words, humble yourself. And those words, like, they hit me differently than those words that hit me before. Humble yourself. It was an invitation for some immediate and on the spot inner work. And I had to, like, and I just, and I'm going to try to describe it. Like, it was, it it was, I I had to, like, take a breath, watch this, and I had to become smaller. I had to become smaller. See, here is the truth. Now, it was tiny. Don't get me wrong, it was tiny. Door. (laughs) Kitchen. Commode, <laughs> cot, all within, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so it was indeed small, but physically, I could fit in it. In my mind, I was too big for it. Don't play with me. Don't play with me. So when God says, humble myself, God. God is not telling me to do something that I don't have the capacity to do. I just needed to have the willingness to do it. And it was between me and God. No one would have known that God and I had the exchange. I called my sister. We would have gotten somewhere else going. But this was between me and God. These type of moments would mark and define how far you get in the Lord. When nobody knows... And you do that thing because God spoke to you in private. And sometimes you can't even tell anybody that you did it. Oh, I feel it right there. There are things that that God will test you about. And he'll say, do it and don't even say you did it. Oh, you're not ready for that. Because, you know, when we do something philanthropic, oh, yeah, yeah, praise God. And I just, yeah, I just just gave 100,000 to that little thing. It wasn't nothing, you know, I did it, you know. (laughs) Or, or, you know, you, you do that GoFundMe thing and you know, that I have the option for anonymous. You're like, the, the devil is a lie. You're going to know who gave you this money. Uh-uh. And sometimes God will say, do it and do it in secret. And he said, if you do it in secret, I'll reward you openly. If you do it and you tell everybody, you got your reward. You got the praise of man. Fine, great. It was one of those moments. I'm going somewhere. And I had to, I had to, I had to, so in this process 
of becoming less, I shrank. And then that made the camel going through the eye of the needle all the more relevant. In other words, if that apartment was the size of an eye of the needle. Wow. <laughs> no, I would have had to. So you always will have the capacity, you always will have the capacity to be as small as you need to be, to fit a moment that will produce a greater glory for you later. He says if you humble yourself in due time, God will exalt you. Are you tracking with me? So, so this, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, but I, I want you to get all of this. So, so it's hard to navigate those two worlds inside of you, the world of business and the world of faith. It's hard. It's, 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 it's a wrestling. The way that you approach things spiritually might have a certain cadence, and business has a cadence, and oftentimes the cadence in business is fast. It's a fast cadence. You've got to make quick decisions. You've got to be quick on your toes. And sometimes there is a, a spiritual discipline that has to be developed in such a way that you can make the right decision quick. Oh, God. So you have to become something to really do this. So you've got these two worlds, these, these two, this struggle, you know, and God calls you to business, and he calls you to this struggle, and I, I'm telling you, it is the greatest struggle of my life. I'm winning it, but it's the greatest struggle of my life. Business and ministry. But I think that the reason why I'm winning it is because I respect the fight. I respect the struggle. I'm praying about it all the time. God, how am I doing? And I'm gonna show you some things that you have to do, but I also wanna show you this text real quick. Two hours and we're finished. It, it's the, it's the, it's, it's, it's the lamb. You seen that thing where scripture talks about lambs and wolves? I send you as lambs and wolves. In fact, let's look at it really quickly, real quickly. Matthew 10, 16 through 18. Look at this. Jesus says, watch this. And this almost seems mean. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's mean. That means you knew what you were getting me into. I send you. You didn't just go, I send you. And if you think about business, come on, somebody. I mean business for real. Not cute, Lou. I'm talking about business for real. You ever felt like you were a sheep amongst wolves? Yet God sent you there. Come on, we have to get into this. We have to get into this. He says, behold, I send you out a sheep amongst wolves amongst wolves, sheep in the midst of wolves. He said, watch this, oh, this gets good. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So he is saying, one, I'm sending you. Two, this is the environment. And what is the environment? Let's keep reading. It says, beware of men. Men get crazy in the marketplace because the values and the rules and the love of money and all that kind of stuff is there and it makes people crazy. So he says, I'm sending you. As, 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 as a lamb, as sheep in the midst of wolves, I need you to be wise as a serpent, harmless dove. We'll come back to that. He says, beware of men. So in this environment, men are crazy. And it says, for they will deliver you up, and count, and up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Your friends one day, enemies the next. Yes. Traps are being set for you. It's crazy. You ever seen two people going to business? And they were friends going in. And enemies by the time it was over. Why? Because that environment is so crazy. And that environment wants to get in you. But you have to be in it. But not of it. And this is hard. That's why I'm teaching this thing. Because you're called to it. God's going to send you in it. But you got to learn how to manage those two things. So what are those two things? So it says, I love it. It says be wise as a serpent. Yet harmless as doves. Can we go a little deeper? So he says, he says, be wise. I love that word. It's a Greek word. It literally means sagacious, but also means discreet. So, so I have to be wise and discreet. And then if you break that word down to its root, it literally means to rein in or to curb the mind or cognitive faculties. See, this is not for the weak. It's not for those who just who are playing. This is for people who recognize that they're going to have to become somebody 
to flow in what they're called to. I feel this so strongly. I'm so grateful that we're, we're hearing this. Anybody grateful that we're hearing this like for real, for real? Like, like we, we're talking about like winning for real. I don't want to win and then next thing you know, my whole empire is crumbling. I don't want to win like that's not winning. I want to win in such a way. The scripture says in Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. I want to win in such a way that my kids win when I'm gone and their kids win. When, oh, I wish I had a few people that really are thinking on another level. I don't want to just win for me. I want to win for generations that will come after me. Who wants to win on that level? Holler at me real quick. I want to win like that. I want to win for my great, 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 great grandkids. They'll still be prospering because I built it right. I learned how to be wise as a serpent. It says, and harmless. That's doves. A lot of times when we rehearse that, that passage, we think it says, be wise as serpents, yet, yet or but, harmless as doves. It doesn't say that. It says and. Both and. Well, let's look up that word where it talks about harmless. That word harmless is a Greek word. Watch this. And it literally means unmixed. In the mix, but unmixed. In the world, but not of the world. Wise, sagacious, discreet in how you operate, having your inner, having curbed in and reigned your insides. You're not just moving by any whim. You're not drawn. You're like Jesus when everything is laid out. He's like, get behind me, I'm good. But that being balanced with being pure, unmixed, it says, Unmixed, harmless as a dove, pure as a dove, unmixed as a dove, which is a nod to the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about these two dimensions and dynamics in concert inside of us. Luke 16 and 8, another parable about doing business. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world, look at what Jesus says. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. We worship well. We don't do business well. And that's why we have been oftentimes the head and not the tail. We've had half of this and consequently we've walked in half of our inheritance. We have our spiritual inheritance but we don't have our impact inheritance. Are you tracking with me? So I want to give you really quickly, really quickly, what I believe will be a formula that will allow you to, as God continues, I feel this, as God continues to open doors for you, as you embrace, because it's going to happen, it was just your mind had to be open before the door can be open. And in some cases, the door was open, but your mind wasn't open, so you couldn't see the open door that was there. So as these doors begin to open for you, my job as always is to prepare you. How do I, how do, I do it? What do I, how, what do I have to do in order to not gain the world and lose my soul? At the end of the day, what it all comes down to is heart management. You have to manage your own heart and then also you have to navigate the reality of the hearts of those you're in business with and even the hearts of your investors. It's, it's tricky, you gotta manage it all. You gotta manage you first. And then you have to navigate, but you can do it. I'm gonna give you six things really quickly. And you just write them down, you think about it, you pray about it, we're gonna pray and we're done. The first thing that I think that you have to do in order to manage your heart properly so that the things won't get you as you get the things and the influence and the impact is to keep your identity in front of you daily. If you've been around me for any length of time, you know that I have literally a 12-point identity statement that I look at every single day. I tell myself who I am every single day. I PT, do you forget who you are every single day? Not necessarily, but just in case. I'm gonna tell myself, right? 
So I have it written out. This is who I am. I am Tere. I talk about my podcast, the Call Podcast. I talked about a few, a few episodes ago. So every day you have to keep who you are in front of you because sometimes you will get into, particularly in business, business moves so fast and there are different rules and different things that you will look up and it could be you know, 20, 24, 36 hours and you're caught up in business. It could be all week with a little bit of sleep you know, and you will forget that you're not after the same thing that other, people's, other people are after. So you have to literally Remind yourself daily, keep your identity in front of you every single day. Write down who you are. And if you need to write down who you're not in that context, do that too. That's number one. Number two is you need to keep your why in front of you daily. My why. Why am I doing this? Right? What is this about? What is this not about? If you know you have a proclivity to make things about what they're not about, then write that down. This is not about that. You have to, it seems simple and maybe even silly, but I'm telling you, you gotta keep yourself in check by defining yourself. Number three, you need to build kingdom accountability in your circle. Now notice I said kingdom accountability. I didn't say religious accountability because I'll be honest with you, sometimes religious people just don't get it. They get the religious stuff good. Right? There's some people that I'll go to for spiritual stuff, but I would never go to for business stuff. And there's some people that I will go to for business stuff that I would never go to for spiritual stuff. Right? But these people are different. These are kingdom people who get it. They get what you're called to. They get you, and they get it. And you won't have a lot of people like that, but you need to have that type of accountability. So just in case you slip on your definition of self, you've got somebody that is projecting the real you onto you and that can rope you back in just in case. Are we tracking together? Okay, number four is you have to maintain high level spiritual disciplines. Your cute little prayer over your meal. Once a day is not gonna cut it. You have to employ some serious disciplines. One, you got to figure out, one, you have to define and spend time in what I like to call the secret place. That's you and God, where you can just get, I mean daily, you and the Lord, find a place in your home, find a place down. I used to have a rock in Malibu that I used to go to early in the morning. I'd go stand on that rock. You know what I mean? I don't even know if that rock is still there. You know what I mean? Global warming and all that. Anyway, but praise the Lord. I used, anyway, I digress. I do that all the time. I'm sorry, but find you a place where you meet with God regularly, a place for you to empty out, to be real, to be open and to honest, to see where you're at, to show God where you're at and allow God to pour into you. You're gonna have to read, read the scripture more. Read these scriptures that I'm talking about. Read about the rich young ruler. You gotta do all these sort of things. I'm talking about high level spiritual disciplines. You gotta rest too. That's another place where it gets you and I talk about that in, uh, in my book, Balance. You know, and if you haven't read that book, you need to read that book. But rest is everything. When you, see we get out of balance when we stop resting and we become a different person. I'm a different person when I'm tired. Two things, when I'm hungry and when I'm tired, I become a different person. Hungry, you can deal with. Tired, that's a problem. Sometimes when you're tired, your standards drop. Can we just have a real conversation? You forget who you are when you're tired, right? That's why as soon as I leave out here after two services, I go straight to the plane, straight to the airport. I'm gone. You ain't gonna catch me tired. Devil is a liar. Okay, I gotta go. All right, all right. So you gotta read, you gotta rest right? Prayer, like a serious prayer life is everything. Keeps you connected to God. It keeps you spiritual. Meditate, right? Uh, have a sense of kingdom community. This is kingdom community, but what are your kingdom communities? What are the environments that you expose yourself to to keep you on the right track? And then lastly, as it relates to that, uh, the high level disciplines, serving is good. Serving is good for you, humbling yourself, serving, going out there and, and being low. Go, go through the eye of the needle. Find something that constantly and consistently puts you through the eye of the needle. Go somewhere where they don't know you and they don't care about you, what you have, what you got. All they care about is what you are, affording them in that moment of service. Go be normal because God's getting ready to make some of you great. I'm gonna tell you right now, just like he did with Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna make your name great and you are gonna be a blessing. Go somewhere where some, no one cares about that. Oh, I feel it right there. You need to be around people. Let me tell you something, I, my, my mom is amazing. I have the most amazing mom ever. My mom is here. Oh, she, she's somewhere. I saw her earlier, she left. My mom is amazing. But let me tell you one thing about my mama. She is unimpressed. 
I'll be like, Mom, I did this, and Mom, I'm going there, and then Mom, and this, 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 this investment coming through. And she's like, oh, that's nice, baby. How's your heart? <laughs> How you and Jesus doing? I love, it's frustrating sometimes, but it's also absolutely amazing because she doesn't care. And sometimes you need somebody in your life that just don't care about all that. All they care about is you. Are you tracking with me? Because we have to remain, we have to remain spiritually sharp. Because I'll tell you right now, business, if it's not managed properly, will make you dull and you won't even know it. You'll become lukewarm and not even know it. And you're saying all the right things, but you don't have the passion and the power. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. Number five, here's a big one. Here's a big one. I'm talking about heart management. Give. Giving is everything. Give as much and as often as you can. In fact, watch this. Instead of having gaining goals, have giving goals. Come on, most of us, oh, I just want to be a millionaire by the time I'm in it. And when you hit that, oh, I want to be a hundred millionaire by I want to be a billionaire. That's your goal. No, no, no. How about not I want to get a billion. I want to give a billion. Just repurpose it. You got to fight back. And last but not least, and this is important, I want you to stand with me. We're going to close on this one. Last but not least is having a willingness to give it all up. I'm talking about how to really do this thing. So you know what's crazy about the story of the rich young ruler? When God looked at him, realized what his issue was, what he needed, and he says, yeah, uh, for you, I need you to sell everything you have and give to the poor and follow me. The rich young ruler thought that God was taking something from him. So when the story plays out, you'll find this in Mark chapter 10. When the story continues to play out, it was actually the opposite. Because Peter started stressing because he was like, well, who then can be saved? Because Peter had left his fishing business. Peter's fish and chips. <laughs> Global. <laughs> And Peter said, who then can be saved? And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, Peter, he said, let me tell you something. There's no one who has left houses. Let me, let me, let me bring it up to contemporary context. There's no one who has left businesses, houses, properties, land, cars, resources, opportunities for my sake and the gospel of the kingdoms, watch this, who will not receive 100-fold of all those things, watch this. Now, it didn't say on that great day, one glad morning, when this life, which is wonderful. That's not what he was talking about. He said, that's not, that hundredfold is going to be now in this time and afterwards eternal life. He wasn't trying to diminish him. He was trying to preserve and multiply him because his discernment was that the thing had him. And I can tell you right now, at least once a year, God asked me for, for my stuff. He does, I ain't gonna lie. I know it's coming too. When I get real happy and get set, and when I get real content, you know what I'm talking about? You ever been there before? You like get, get everything where you want it. And you're comfortable. Not comfortable, you're comfortable. And then God says, hey, um, it happened to me. I was in um, Hawaii, and I drove past um, some relative poverty in Hawaii. And God kind of slowed me down and had me look at it. And I'm like, oh, God, what am I? What? And he said, if I, if I asked you to, would you sell everything and move into that little space right there? And it's like this real moment. And you can't, what, you, you going to lie to God? Sure, Jesus. It's got to be real because that's the only way that God deals. And if you know the answer is no, and sometimes the immediate response is, wait, hold up, not yet, hold up. I got to get there. Watch this. I got to shrink. I right, get back. That's that needle. That's that eye of the needle. I got to hang. Right now, if I try to go through it, I'm going to scratch myself up. But I can get there. And periodically, I promise you this, family, every level requires a new needle experience. And the only way you know that you're in the right space, truly in the right space, walking in your anointed, predestined fruitfulness 
as if you can say sometimes with tears, God, if I got to go to that eye, I'll become whatever I need to become to go to the eye that needle. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this time with your sons and daughters. I thank you for the rich love that you have for them. I know it because I can feel it flowing through me towards them right now. You're for them and not against them, and you got them. And you are Abba Father. You are not just their God, but you are their father. You are their parent. You are their maker. You are their creator. And you will never fail them nor forsake them. And you will guide them through this life. Hallelujah. And after this life, you will receive them into their everlasting habitat of glory. Now, Lord, your word will not return into you void. And God, I thank you, even as we prayed in the beginning, Lord God, that we would be good receivers. For you have sown great seed, not just those in the room, but those who are watching, those who will watch, and those who will listen. I thank you that these words will take root and bear fruit, and that we're different, we're changed, God. When you give a word, you change our lives. So our lives has changed, our expectation is changed, our surrender is changed, our hunger has changed, our eyes are open. We will see those doors that you have opened because our eyes are now open. Seal this word in the hearts and the minds of these, your sons and daughters. Now, God, we recognize that it is completely of no profit for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. So I'm praying right now for those who have yet to open up their heart to you. Mm. Though you knock, even in this moment, there is still a requirement for us to open our hearts and allow you to come in. So, Father, I'm praying right now for those who are watching and those who are listening, God, as you are knocking, because this is an individual, personal thing. I pray that the grace to open the door and say, yes, have your way in me, would transpire right now in the hearts and the minds of those who need to take you in, that you might be their God, their Father, their Savior, and that they might, from a confession standpoint, be your child and to that end may we all repeat together dear heavenly father thank you for this word I receive it thank you for this atmosphere I'm grateful for it thank you for Jesus thank you for making him who had no sin no limitation no weakness no shortcoming Thank you for making him all of mine. You put my sin, my mistake, my brokenness, my pain in his body. Nailed it to the cross and put it to death. And as he was raised up, free and victorious, because I'm in him, I'm raised up too. My past is behind me. I am a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are becoming new. Holy Spirit, fill me to the overflow that I might be who you have designed me to be. That I might walk in your truth, in your power, and in your ability to possess every promise that belongs to me, my children, and my children's children. I love you, God, because you love me first. Now I thank you that this is the first day of the rest of my life, and it's awesome, beautiful, blessed, full of restoration. <laughs> I claim it now that I'll never be the same in Jesus name amen amen God bless you may the Lord bless and keep you may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious toward you may he lift up his countenance over you and grant you shalom shalom in Jesus name I love you God bless you I'll see you real soon